We would like to thank Audible for its support of the Brainwaves podcast. With over 180,000 audio titles available to stream, there's plenty to choose from. I recommend When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi, the heartbreaking and yet beautiful account of a young neurosurgeon in training who dies from lung cancer. These and other stories can be yours for a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. That's audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. In 1995, three multicenter randomized clinical trials, two published studies, demonstrated that intravenous tissue plasminogen activator, when given within the first three hours of stroke symptom onset, could significantly reduce long-term disability in select patient populations. In a third iteration of one of those trials, the treatment window was extended to four and a half hours with similar efficacy. Since that time, we have also seen a number of outcome measures improve with the use of this clot-busting medication. Things like residual neurologic deficits, cognitive performance, and even mortality. In 2014, after many years of failed clinical trials, a new intervention was found to improve functional outcomes in selected acute stroke patients. These stent retriever devices, when utilized in the first six to eight hours of acute stroke onset, could successfully extract large clots from proximal anterior intracranial vessels, meaning the terminal ICA proximal MCA, or M1 segment, and select distal MCA segments. This treatment option is unbelievably powerful, like Death Star powerful. Think of it this way. IVTPA can increase the absolute odds of a good functional outcome, meaning becoming functionally independent by about 10-15% to in acute ischemic stroke. This number is about 30 to 40% for the mechanical thrombectomy, according to recent trials. Alternatively, clinician scientists may describe a number needed to treat among their outcomes. And this statistic references the number of patients that you must treat with your intervention in order for one patient to achieve the desired outcome. For IVTPA, that number is about eight. Eight patients must be treated for one to become functionally independent at three months. For mechanical thrombectomy, This number is four. Don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy... And we're going to talk about what that means in the context of TPA with thrombectomy and try to clarify some of this information to see really if this is an absolute reference to thrombectomy alone. And it begs the question, if mechanical thrombectomy is so much more powerful than IVTPA, doesn't that render TPA kind of moot or obsolete? If thrombectomy is so effective for stroke patients, should we even waste our time and money trying to mix and administer the altiplase? These are tough questions to answer for some, but hopefully by the end of this Brainwaves episode, you should have your own opinion on the matter. To address whether one, the other, or even both therapies are the best for your stroke patient, we should at least acknowledge the limitations of each therapy. Things like duration of symptoms, symptom severity, neuroimaging characteristics, and past medical history. To do this, I called in a favor from an old friend and a mentor of mine, Dr. Cheryl martin Shield. I am the president and CEO of Dr. Brain Incorporated, and I'm the stroke medical director for the Louisiana Emergency Response Network. Thanks for being on our show today. Thank you for having me, Jim. Let's get to our first hurdle, time. Obviously, time is a major barrier to emergent treatment of acute stroke that you see in the ED. Jim, timing is everything. Every single minute matters. And the minutes that matter most are those between the time of onset and the time emergency services are accessed. About half of all patients are excluded from any form of recanalization therapy because they don't even get to the hospital and during the time frame when those therapies have been demonstrated to be effective at reducing long-term disabilities. Failure to reach the emergency department in the first four and a half hours is the number one reason why a patient doesn't get IV TPA. A small proportion of patients arrive before 4.5 hours, but can't get treated within the first four and a half hours due to inherent or pathological process delays with giving TPA. There's another small proportion that arrives between four and a half and six hours, but only 15 to 20 percent of those patients are going to have large vessel occlusions, which are appropriate to refer for mechanical thrombectomy. It's a major problem. 
We have an intervention, super powerful, as you mentioned, mechanical thrombectomy. It's been declared standard of care for large vessel occlusions, but we have a problem. It's not available standardly. Let's take the best case scenario. You have a patient, they roll up to a center with pre-hospital notification that has mechanical thrombectomy. They're there one hour after the onset of a right MCA syndrome. You got a hospital whose usual door to needle time is 45 minutes based on the recommendations. She has her stroke code started in the CT suite, clearly has disabling deficits. She's able to tell you she doesn't take any medicines. She's able to tell you no to all the questions that you ask her about exclusions for TPA. They also need to know if the patient has bleeding disorders, is taking blood thinner medications like Coumadin, or has uncontrolled high blood pressure. You pre consent her for TPA while access is being obtained and blood's drawn. Blood pressure is not a problem. TPA gets pulled, it's mixed, everyone clears the room so that scan can be performed. And then you celebrate, yay, no blood. So somebody runs in, they push the bolus, you celebrate because you gave TPA 11 minutes from arrival. Somebody finished her stroke scale, let's say it's something like 16 or 18. You run out of the room, CTA gets done. Sure enough, you're a genius. She's got a proximal right MCA occlusion and you call your endovascular doc while the TPA is being hung. Now let's go to another scenario, more typical. Let's say this patient is, you know, the usual patient, rolls in, private vehicle, to an acute stroke ready hospital, 30 minutes from a center with mechanical thrombectomy capability. She's already three hours into her left MCA syndrome. The ED team starts their assessment, they wait for the husband who's trying to find a parking space so that they can get some history about this woman. The center has a usual door to needle time of about 79 minutes. They have telestroke, but their telestroke docs don't want to be called until all necessary data is ready to make a decision. Labs are drawn, they have to wait because, of course, she's taken warfarin. She gets her CT scan 22 minutes after arrival, read 10 minutes later, no hemorrhage, no contraindication of TPA. Great, her INR results 55 minutes after she arrives, 1.4. Telemedicine team's called, doc's on the robot. They spend another 20 minutes examining the patient, speaking to her husband about risks and benefits. Husband consents. Takes 12 more minutes to get the TPA from the pharmacy, and then the bolus is given. Door to needle time, 87 minutes. Now that telestroke doc tells you, get that patient over to our center super fast. She needs mechanical thrombectomy. What's gonna happen? The ED staff call for a transfer. They need a critical care truck, right? TPA is going. Takes another 30 minutes for the ambulance to get there. Another 15 minutes to pack her up. 25 minutes with lights and sirens to get to the endovascular center, where, of course, a CT and CTA is performed because it wasn't performed at the initial hospital. Now the CT shows her aspects as decayed from 9 to 7, and she goes to the cath lab at 6 hours from the onset of her symptoms. So, like... That's the usual scenario. I mean, the logistics are staggering, right? There are so many obstacles inherent to getting a patient ready for TPA and preparing a patient for transfer for thrombectomy, labs, history, exam, CT scan. And mixing the TPA, some have argued, will take even more time and may even delay the transfer process itself. The preparation of IV TPA should not slow you down. TPA should be kept in the ED pixels. It takes no more than two minutes to mix and a, maybe a minute to pull up the bolus. Hospitals that keep TPA in their pharmacy often have unacceptable delays. I mean, even a few minutes lost is unacceptable. Then try getting it from the pharmacy in off hours or when you have a single weekend pharmacy pharmacist available. Even more time can be lost. But the time to start thinking about whether a patient needs mechanical thrombectomy isn't after the TPA is hung. It's the moment you lay eyes on that patient. Do they have a gaze deviation? Are they aphasic? Are they neglecting one side? Cortical signs. Can they see you're wiggling in all four quadrants? Yeah, the cortical signs. It doesn't take but a minute to map deficits with anatomy and know that a large tar territory is affected, which conforms to a large artery, and that that large vessel might be occluded. Okay, and delay to treatment is obviously the most important barrier. And, you know, mixing TPA should not be one of those barriers anymore, even though some people feel like it can be. 
And a second consideration is of whether IVTPA thrombectomy or both can be useful to the patient is the patient's symptom severity. And in your case, you mentioned a patient had a stroke scale of 16, possibly with anterior circulation occlusion. How does the NIHSS or the patient's symptom profile affect your decision to treat with either modality? First of all, I think with regards to decisions on treatment, Jim, it isn't about a number. It's about disability and fighting against disability. If a patient tells me that their symptoms or deficits would be disabling, that's all I need to know. That's when I start telling them that there's something that we could do about it and start discussing risks and benefits. There's no stroke scale cutoff I would regard. A stroke scale of zero with dominant distal upper extremity weakness would be disabling to most people, certainly you and me. A stroke scale of zero with vertigo and axial gait disturbance would be disabling to most people. I'd treat either of those patients with IVTPA, and that would be supported by the recommendations in the 2015 scientific rationale paper. With regard to thrombectomy, it's the patient who should be treated, not the clot. If a patient has new disabling deficits, evidence of a large vessel occlusion, and a CT scan that looks good, meaning that they have a favorable aspect score, I'm going to refer them for emergent thrombectomy. I don't need a CTA to tell me that a patient has a large vessel occlusion, but there's valuable information that can be obtained in a CTA and our proceduralists usually want the study. So it's important to have that built into your protocol so that you don't lose any time determining eligibility for TPA and giving TPA when appropriate, but also able to get that CT scan done. And while you mentioned CTA as a imaging modality to either identify large vessel occlusion, you said it's not necessary, but there are other imaging modalities that can be used or implemented to determine what degree of salvageable penumbra exists and whether or not uh, mechanical thrombectomy may be superior. Can you talk about some of these other additional imaging studies? Sure. I mean, some people use CT perfusion imaging. You know, I've, I've come full circle two or three times about CT perfusion imaging. I don't really need it. I, I use the aspect score and a combination of aspects and collaterals to determine whether or not I think a patient's a good candidate and has brain tissue that I can save. But a lot of hospitals do get a CT perfusion, and it does provide some very objective determination of the proportion of brain tissue that, that could be saved with the presumption that that vessel gets opened you can also use a pattern on MRI looking at the, the relative difference of diffusion weighted imaging positivity and the proportion of brain tissue on flare that also shows evidence of ischemic changes. If there's mismatch between the diffusion weighted image and the flare image, that can show you also the brain region that isn't quite dead yet. One easily identifiable reason that a patient should not get TPA is that there are contraindications, either relative or absolute, to TPA, but the same contraindications don't exist for thrombectomy. When would you consider thrombectomy alone in patients? The only scenarios I can think of and have can recall, which would make me skip TPA for a patient with a large vessel occlusion are patients that get there such that they're out of the feasible window for TPA, but can get treated with endovascular, at least with groin puncture by six hours. Which you mentioned is very few patients. Or they have current NOAC use or an INR greater than 1.70 while on warfarin, or they've been exposed to heparin surgery with a high chance of a bloody outcome, and if they're actively bleeding systemically, those are the scenarios for which I would skip TPA and work towards getting that patient to the cath lab. So we've covered some of the easier topics uh, in this episode. Now I want to move on to something a little bit more controversial. From three of the five most recent major clinical trials, uh, the Mr. Clean, Swift Prime, and Extend IA, and the Hermes collaboration, which has put together pooled data from those five trials, we've learned that thrombectomy plus TPA is superior to TPA alone. That's without a doubt. But this does not mean that thrombectomy plus TPA is superior to thrombectomy alone. Now this is kind of an interesting question. 
For a patient with severe deficits and who meets criteria for a mechanical thrombectomy, if you're able to hang the TPA without slowing down the process of transporting the patient to angio, might both therapies in conjunction be more effective than thrombectomy alone? Well, there's one very important point you need to keep in mind when you're interpreting analyses of TPA plus thrombectomy compared to thrombectomy alone from these endovascular trials. And none of them was treatment with TPA randomized. It's inappropriate to make that leap in logic. There are reasons why people who didn't get TPA first didn't get it. There's no evidence from a randomized trial to support the idea of skipping TPA. If a hospital can't get TPA going before the cath lab is ready, then I think they either have a serious process problem running stroke codes, a super fast and ambitious cath lab, or both. But that scenario is far from the usual scenario. So there was a, an interesting paper that came out in JAMA 2017. It was published in JAMA that uh, was a retrospective analysis of pooled data from SWIFT and STAR trials that showed that thrombectomy plus TPA was not superior to thrombectomy alone. And that's one of the only real studies that have kind of tried to address this question besides the randomized controlled trials in the Hermes collaboration that have looked at thrombectomy plus TPA versus thrombectomy. And there's some other retrospective data that suggests that thrombectomy plus TPA does not necessarily increase the odds of a better outcome than thrombectomy alone. But again, these are all retrospective. Dr. Jim Grotta, who's a world expert in this field and practices in Houston, has called these findings and the Swift and Star pooled analysis a dangerous and ill-founded conclusion. What would you say to people who would interpret the findings from JAMA as kind of a gold standard and who would practice that way? Well, first, Jim Grotta is my stroke dad, and he's correct. Non-endovascular centers vastly outnumber endovascular centers. Even with changes to destination protocols for patients who appear to have large vessel occlusions based on one screening tool or another in the field, non-endovascular centers are still going to receive the vast majority of acute stroke patients. Those centers have to be proficient and efficient in giving TPA. It is the cornerstone of acute ischemic stroke therapy and likely always will. Whenever possible, TPA should be administered, even if thrombectomy is on the table, because there could be unforeseeable delays in transfer to a comprehensive or uh, endovascular stroke center, uh, or TPA itself can be effective in recanalization and reperfusion and improvement in deficits. And it may even trump the need to have an endovascular procedure, which carries more risk than IV TPA alone. Most of the proceduralists with whom I've collaborated on endovascular cases tell me that patients who get TPA first have clots which are easier to remove with the stent retriever devices or with the suction catheters. You know, they're certainly cost affected. I mean, you know, upfront cost of getting thrombectomy and TPA is going to be higher than, than thrombectomy or TPA alone. But those long-term costs and disability-adjusted life years are certainly more favorable given the greater functional recovery of these patients who come in with this devastating form of ischemic stroke. To hurry. It's all going to come back. Just yesterday, I had a full day of activities, but then I paid for it last night because I was extremely tired and wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get up properly. But I, you know, the Lord opened my eyes and said, Joe, we're not done with you. So I, I think that the balance favors being aggressive and using all modalities of therapy that have proven benefit. Okay, so you, you would believe that there is absolutely no controversy whatsoever. TPA, if there's no contraindication, and try to take the patient for thrombectomy if they're an appropriate candidate. Yeah, TPA is far from dead, Jim. TPA remains the cornerstone of acute stroke treatment. It doesn't require the expense of manpower and equipment of endovascular therapy, and therefore it's available in all CSEs, it's available in all PSEs, and it is supposed to be available in all acute stroke-ready hospitals where most patients are going to go. What we really need to focus on is getting patients to hospitals with the capability to provide what they need. 
um, which is more often TPA than endovascular therapy since most strokes are not caused by proximal large vessel occlusion. And we really need to work towards improving the proficiency of treating patients with TPA based on the revised American Heart Association, Stroke Association recommendations. We need to work towards improving the efficiency of treating with TPA in hospitals that don't have endovascular capability. And, and we really need to focus on pathways that have concurrent screening for large vessel occlusion and efficient transfers when those patients are identified. So let me just try to summarize what we've discussed today. In the major clinical trials in the Hermes collaboration, the patients receive thrombectomy and TPA in the majority of cases, and the thrombectomy arm ended up doing better. And it's probably and most likely related to the fact that these patients also receive TPA. And any kind of post hoc analyses of prior trials or retrospective data that suggests that thrombectomy plus TPA is not superior to thrombectomy alone is kind of debunked at this point. Whenever you can treat somebody with TPA, try to treat somebody with TPA. And if they're an appropriate candidate for thrombectomy, definitely try to you know mobilize and get the patient to the angio suite as soon as possible. TPA is not a contraindication to thrombectomy, and preparing somebody for thrombectomy does not necessarily mean that you have to slow down the process of TPA. Try and get the TPA on board as soon as possible. Cool. Well, thank you so much for helping me clarify the issue and for our listeners out there as well. Uh, as always, it's great to chat with you, Dr. Martin Shield. I really can't wait to see you again at the International Stroke Conference next year. Every year we always have a great time. Um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll have much more groundbreaking research to hear about uh, in 2018. Nothing's been quite as exciting as the year of the mechanical thrombectomy. I can't agree with you more. Thank you so much for having me on the show to talk about one of my favorite things. That's all this week for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening to our show. As always, please let us know what you think by rating us on iTunes or whatever other podcast app you're using. I want to thank all the listeners to our show who have spread the word about Brainwaves. It's really grown in recent months, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of your help with this. If you haven't already, you can find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at facebook.com slash Brainwaves Podcast. We're on Instagram now at Brainwaves Podcast as well. And we're mostly posting photos of our dog, Kingsley, who's this incredible Beagle Terrier mix. The patient's story you heard earlier was Joe Williams. He was treated in Atlanta, Georgia. And you can find his whole story on YouTube with the link that we posted on our website at brainwaves.me. This episode was produced by me and by Erica Mejia. Music was courtesy of Lee Rosevier, Kevin McLeod, Josh Woodward, and Little Glass Men. I'm Jim Ziegler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. Cool. See, that was easy, right? Yeah, that was fun. I hope I did a good job.